For the next 45 minutes, we'll talk about the Tokov standard and enterprise architecture in a more general context. Our expert here today is Ben Calland. And well, maybe we start with the short introduction that what's your background for this topic and the otherwise. So. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a trainer uh, and I have a, a collection of uh, training areas I, I train. Most of them are frameworks. I'll show you a, a, a sort of a meta framework here because when we are in IT, we could um, organize uh, our activities into a few large boxes. We design things, we develop things according to the, the design. We then deploy the services or, or software or whatever we have designed. Then we operate it. But we also need to plan everything to govern and to improve. And for each of those, there, there are frameworks that uh, fit uh, the particular needs. Here you can see, if you are, we are in the operational part, uh, service management, for instance, ITIL is a good framework. Uh, but today we are going to talk about TOGAF, which is a framework mainly for planning and designing. Uh, ITIL is not very good for that. Uh, if we are mainly interested in improving things, Lean would be a good framework. If we are uh, developing uh, software, for instance, uh, Scrum could be a, a model for that. Uh, a deployment project could be organized according to Prince too. Uh, if we want to govern everything, then COVID is a, is a framework uh, that's suitable for govern, governance. Uh, so what we're mainly interested in today is this part. We are planning and designing things. Uh, we use the word enterprise architecture for, for describing the activity of, of planning and, and designing how an uh, organization works. Uh, so we are mainly going to talk about those. I may mention uh, occasionally some of the other frameworks, but uh, this, this is the the main topic for today. Before we actually go more into architecture directly, how do you see these frameworks? Do they work nicely together or, I mean, would you choose some and then stick to that or how do well, you do it? There's the classical answer from, from any consultant, it depends. Uh, you can actually have a situation where you use uh, all of these frameworks in the same organization. There's no, not, nothing uh, preventing you from doing that. However, you need to be aware that uh, they are all somewhat incompatible in terms of terminology. They may use the same term in different meanings, or they may talk about the same thing, uh, but use different uh, terminology. Just as an example, uh, in ITIL, we have a concept called uh, practices. Uh, we have the same concept in TOGAF, but it's called capabilities, and the same concept in COVID, and it's called management objectives. You just need to be aware that uh, there's no such thing as a, as a uh, common framework for everything, a framework to, to rule everything. Uh, so you just, uh, you can pick and choose, and you can create your own version of this, because you need to, to uh, in the organization, you need to decide uh, which is your sort of Go to framework. What what is the terminology you're going to use? Uh, all of these are uh, adaptable. You can can change them according to your needs. But yes, it's possible to use all of them at the same time. And many organizations uh, use uh, more than two or three of them. Uh, I'm not sure if I have ever seen one organization that uses all of them. Uh, but uh, yes, there are many other frameworks. For instance, DevOps would be somewhere here between operation and, and uh, uh, development. And uh, FitSM would be very close to, to, to uh, ITIL here. Uh, you could basically put any uh, common framework in this uh, image just to show the relationship between them. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the different terms. And the, the one thing what might be good to clarify regarding TOGAF it's called enterprise architecture. So, well, first of all, enterprise is it's only for the big, big things, big companies, and the other part is, of course, the architecture. So, yeah, what is enterprise architecture? Let, let's take the first part. What is an enterprise? Uh, you could have the wrong impression that enterprise means that it has to be has to be a huge uh, multinational organization in order to to have some kind of uh, enterprise uh, architecture. In this context. Enterprise means anything. It could be a small 
uh, group, it could be uh, the whole industry. In some cases, it could be a, a government uh, uh, department. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a for-profit type of, of enterprise. So it, it's quite a, an umbrella term, meaning any organized activity can be an uh, enterprise. Uh, and the follow-up question to that, of course, is do we need enterprise architecture for all companies? Uh, I would say no, because there are small companies, let's say you have a coffee shop or a restaurant, uh, uh, it would be rather stupid to have a very organized enterprise architecture for such an or organization. There's a term for stupid in uh, lean, it's called waste, we don't want to do that. Waste is when we invest resources and we don't get any value out, so I wouldn't advise a small restaurant to yeah, go and do some enterprise architecture. It's mainly uh, interesting in an uh, in a situation where, where you have uh, quite a lot of uh, going on, you need to understand what's going on, and that's when you need the, the, the architecture. So what is actually architecture? Uh, many people, when we talk about architecture, uh, think about buildings, and that's natural because that's, that's the most common way of using the term. Uh, but it's not only buildings that have architectures. A city has architecture, an organization has architecture. Uh, so um, you could say that the art of architecture is to, to uh, describe how something works, what are the parts of it, and how do they fit uh, together. Uh, so when we talk about organizations, then we need to know uh, what is our business model, what kind of processes, what kind of services do we have, uh, what kind of software are we using? How is our data flowing uh, here? What kind of technology we, do we need? So all of this uh, is under the umbrella term enterprise architecture. So you could talk about business architecture, you could talk about uh, technology architecture, all of these sort of uh, 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 under the same term. So architecture, or in this case, enterprise architecture, is describing how do we do things, how do we do it now, and more importantly, how are we going to do this in the future? So we talk about the uh, what we have now uh, as is, uh, or in Togaf speak, uh, it's, it's the baseline architecture. And then we have the to be, or in Togaf speak, it's the uh, target architecture. Uh, so you describe the organization, uh, model it, and, and then you communicate about this uh, to, to other people. That's why we would need an uh, architecture. Okay, um, well then, if we talk about more closely about TOGAF, you already mentioned a few things about it, but briefly, I mean, well, TOGAF is a rather large con uh, entity, but briefly, how does the TOGAF work? Yeah, I already... And what do you do with it, actually? Yeah, uh, I already mentioned that from uh, TOGAF point of view, how TOGAF sees is, is that we have a, a so-called domains, we have an area of business architecture, uh, information system architecture, and technology architecture. But you could ac actually uh, use it in any way you feel. If you feel that we need a process architecture or a service architecture, that's perfectly all right. You can use TOGAF for that. And the structure of TOGAF is that there's a method called uh, the ADM. It's the architecture development method. And then there's a, a, a number of... of uh, um, separate documents describing different parts of it. So there's a, a, a document uh, describing how do you business scenarios. There's in, uh, one part that describes uh, how do you create a repository for, for uh, uh, TOGAF and so on. It's modular, so it's a, a number of different sort of uh, independent documents and uh, TOGAF is a collection term for all of these. Um, well, ADM is, is kind of the crucial or the most central part of TOGAF, so maybe you could say a few words, speak more about that one. Yeah, let's have a look at the ADM. The most common uh, metaphor for ADM uh, is that we have this kind of uh, image where we have a number of circles, they are faces. Uh, so, but the TOGAF, the ADM means architecture development method. So this is basically a method where you follow a, a systematic approach to do the architecture. So let, let me talk you through this, uh, how it works. Uh, up there, we have something called a preliminary phase. This is something you do basically only once. This is where you set everything up. You hire architects, you decide on what the tool you're going to use, and decide on the budget, who is going to do what. So you do this once, and then when it's done, 
uh, you're good to go, and then you can start doing actual architecture. So that this is not really architecture work. This is to setting everything up. So that's basically if you haven't been using Dogaf before. Exactly. Yeah. That's you. You need to do something. So the the uh, trigger for preliminary phase is we need to do something, and the end point of the preliminary phases. Now we have established an architecture capability. And then when you actually do the architecture, then you always start from A and then you go this way uh, through the phases. So I'm going to talk you through this uh, briefly. Uh, how does this work and, and uh, what is the benefit of, of, of having a, a, such a structured approach to doing architecture. The first phase, architecture vision, is really about scoping. So this is about understanding uh, what we are supposed to do, uh, and uh, how much, how deep, how broad, for for whom, what is the point of this? So this is the discussion you have with the, the whoever has or uh, has um, sort of asked you to do uh, the architecture. So you have a sponsor or, or or some kind of stakeholder that says, let's do this thing, and and the A phase is about understanding. What do you mean? If the request for architecture work is very good, then you can start doing architecture. But usually it's not. Usually it's, it's a bit vague. We need to plan that. And then you need to ask more questions. What do you mean? Do you mean this or do you mean that? So this is really about scoping. Uh, and this phase ends when we have agreed uh, uh, on the scope. So you get permission to 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 continue with the actual architecture work. But you could say that in the um, vision phase, you uh, do at least some kind of high-level architecture work because you can't go further unless you have some kind of uh, common understanding of, of what uh, are you supposed to do here. So this is uh, always, this is compulsory according to Togaf. You always have to start with A. You can't start with uh, migration planning uh, unless you have, uh, if you, if you have to have some kind of, of, of uh, common understanding of what this is about before you do anything else. But then the next phase is, we have three phases here. We have business architecture, we have information system architecture and technology architecture. These three are basically the same. It's just that they uh, are interested in different domains, different areas. So the order can be any, we don't have to start with, and we can skip if the business architecture is already there and we don't need to change it, we just go directly into the information system architecture. Or we can skip even that and just look at the technology. Or the other way around, we don't go uh, uh, anywhere near those two, we just do the business architecture. So there's no order, they just in this order to make the image look nice. So it's uh, they're basically at the same time. You can do it at the same time, you can skip, you can go back and so on. So these are uh, the phases where you actually do the architecture. This is architecture work. So as input, uh, you have a, a common understanding, what are you supposed to do? And the output is the architecture. So this is paperwork. You do plans, you do designs, uh, and you put them all into the uh, repository. Uh, so after these three phases, you already have uh, some kind of architecture. But then you have two uh, more phases here. Uh, both are about migration planning. The name of the phases are opportunities and solutions and migration, migration planning. But as you can see here in the diagram, there is something called transition planning iteration. So you iterate between those two. And the main difference here is that uh, the phase E is uh, mainly about creating a high-level roadmap. In what order are we going to do things? Because usually when you do architecture, uh, it's not something you can do as one project uh, the next month. Uh, it's usually something that goes over several years. And then you need to have some kind of roadmap. What are we going to do this year? What are we going to do next year? What are we going to do the year after that? And uh, when the roadmap is uh, somewhat ready, you go deeper into the migration planning. You look at the projects. Uh, what kind of budget do you have? Uh, what kind of uh, resources do you have? And you make a particular uh, project plan, and then you use whatever project management method uh, uh, you have in the organization. TOGAF is neutral. Uh, uh, TOGAF does not mandate a specific method. You can use anything. You can use Prince2, or you can use uh, any uh, something you invented yourself. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, this is really project management, uh, or really more uh, correctly uh, planning for the project. This is not really 
doing the project yet. It's just for planning. So you iterate between those two uh, phases until you have a migration plan. So in short, architecture vision is about understanding what we are going to do. BCD is about actually doing it. And then E and F is about uh, planning for the migration, in which order, with whom, who is going to do what, and, and where do we get the money to do it. And uh, in the TOGAF model, now the architecture is uh, official. Now it's uh, approved. It's somewhere in the uh, repository. And uh, after this, it's under change control. You can change it unless you have a, a change management uh, process for it. Up to that moment, you can change anything. So if an architect thinks that, no, this is actually bad, I'm going to do it in a different way. That's just business as usual. That's something you're allowed to do. There's no uh, change management as such. Of course, we may have some change management in the project if you go over budget or something, but it's not really a change management for the architecture. But when you are finishing uh, uh, the F, then the architecture is so to speak approved. It has got a, a, a stamp or, or uh, some kind of approval and then it should be under change management because otherwise what can happen is that somebody changes something and we don't know because there is no model for, 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 for doing that. And then we have the, the next uh, phase which is called implementation governance. Uh, this is not uh, uh, really architecture work in the sense that uh, it's not about uh, modeling something or, or making uh, diagrams. It's about controlling the implementation. So when we do architecture, we have to be aware that uh, if we don't control implementation, we are basically giving them free hands to do whatever they want. And why do, what, what is the point of architecture if you don't uh, somehow govern the usage of architecture? So implementation governance is about making sure that whenever there's an implementation project, that they do follow the architecture. Uh, so, um, and of course, there should be some kind of governance model. What are we going to do if somebody is not compliant? What are we going to do if they uh, have a good reason to do something differently than what the architecture says. So we should have some kind of governance model for, for uh, how to do that. But the phase G is really about uh, uh, governing the, the uh, implementation. It's not the actual implementation. TOGAF doesn't take a stand on about how you do software uh, uh, development, for instance. It just says that it has to follow the, the architecture and uh, we have a model for how to govern that. And then uh, the last one of, of those uh, circles is called architecture change management. Uh, it's called a phase, uh, but it's not a phase in the sense that when everything else is done, then you do change management. This is something that can be done at any time, but this is about controlling changes to the architecture. So the result from that can be, no, we are not allowing any changes. That's called uh, architecture enforcement. And then we can have a dispensation, which means that, yeah, we're not going to change our architecture, but you are allowed for a limited time to do something else. The reason could be money, time, uh, risk, something like that. So we have a phase called change management that is mainly interested in, in, in controlling the changes to architecture. And then in the middle we have something called requirements management that is also not a phase in the sense that it's not uh, something that happens after everything is. It's always there and you can see that the arrows go from both uh, directions. So anywhere, anytime an architect uh, creates something new, uh, they need to have a look at the requirements management. Is there any requirement I need to, to, to be aware of, take care of? And also, it might happen that an architect gets, uh, uncovers a new requirement. We didn't know that, but this is actually a requirement. He puts it into the requirement repository. So this is a structured way of working. That's the point of the, the ADM. Instead of having a, a sort of a ad hoc or, or improvising uh, style of doing things. We have a systematic uh, approach uh, divided into phases and that gives structure to, the, to the, 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 the architecture work. So would you say that's the main benefit of, of using the TOGAF or what do you say what's what are the benefits of it's a rather heavy model in a way? Yeah it's true um, it, it look might look uh, uh, quite uh, bureaucratic because uh, there are a lot of inputs and outputs and, and documents and deliverables going here and there. Uh, the benefit would be that uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, having an, an 
unsystematic way that everybody does uh, things in, in different ways. You have a, a controlled and auditable way of doing things. So you can say, are, are you done with this phase? Do you, uh, do you have this deliverably? Can I check it? Uh, so uh, it gives you a systematic way of doing, and usually this is a good thing. Uh, TOGAF, however, allows you to, to uh, uh, go outside the model. It, it's not the prescriptive model in the sense that you have to do this in order to be compliant. This is just a template for how you could organize your own work. Actually, TOGAF says that in the preliminary phase, when you start doing architecture work, you should take TOGAF and uh, uh, adapt it to your own needs. Uh, it's not intended to be used as such. It's intended to, to be adapted and, and tailored to your, your own organization. But this is not the whole picture of the TOGAF. There's uh, more. <laughs> there's more. <laughs> uh, usually there is more. Um, the reason I wanted to start with this is that very often when we talk about TOGAF, uh, we are actually talking about the ADM. So when people say that we are following TOGAF, what they're actually saying, we are following the ADM. But there's more. There's, uh, uh, for instance, there's a, a set of uh, uh, tools you can use or technologies or, 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 or techniques you can use for all of this. For instance, how do you do gap analysis? How do you do risk analysis? How do you do uh, business transformation readiness? All of these are, are collected in a, in a special uh, document that it's called techniques. There's another document that describes the repository we are going to use. And I'll show you a set of other documents here. Uh, these are all separate documents. They are part of the TOGAF standard. For instance, if you're interested in value streams or business capabilities or business models, you will find about 50 pages each uh, uh, a document describing those. Uh, there are business scenarios. There's a, a, a very good document called A Practitioner's Approach to Following the TOGAF ADM uh, that's written by an experienced, experienced or maybe a couple of experienced uh, architects. Uh, and it's very different from TOGAF itself because the TOGAF itself looks like a uh, list, a, a giant checklist. This is more like a book uh, where you, how you actually use this. Uh, it's free to use. Uh, it's 150 pages, so it's it's really a book. It's not the book you read, read uh, in two hours. It's something you read for a week because you really need to think about uh, all the things. So there are a lot of uh, uh, additional content uh, beside the ADM uh, explaining the ADM, but still ADM is the core of the, of the you can't really say that you're using TOGAF if you use everything else but not the ADM. That sounds a bit strange. So, so yeah, a ADM is, is, the, is the, the heart of the, the TOGAF standard. Um, <clears throat> there's a question that, um, what's the cost of using TOGAF? Oh. You mentioned it's, it's free, some yeah. parts. Yeah, let's talk about cost. Uh, of course, uh, to, to actually use TOGAF, it's free. It's, it's uh, readily available. Uh, it's, uh, you can... If you print it yourself, it's free. You can buy it as a book, and then it costs, you know, like a book, book costs. It's, it's a few uh, uh, dollars, a few euros. It's, it's not much. There's no uh, licensing model that you have to buy uh, to, to be able to use it. Uh, if you want to use the TOGAF uh, trademark, then, for instance, if I train a course called TOGAF something, then I need to pay license fee for that. But uh, if you're talking about an organization that wants to use TOGAF uh, for themselves, that's free. But uh, actually, there's nothing is free in life. So uh, of course, it's cost because you need architects and you need to train them. That's probably going to cost something. And of course, it takes time. Time is always money. Uh, I don't think anybody can answer the question, how much does, how much does it cost to use uh, TOGAF? You could turn it the other way around. How much does it cost you if you don't use TOGAF? Because actually, it uh, gives benefits to you. And if you uh, don't use it, you won't get those benefits. So it, Depends on what you are counting as a cost. Uh, but yes, the, the standard itself is uh, free. So basically, you can go to the, uh, the website of the, the open group and, and get the exactly. standard from there and then yeah. study yourself or exactly. however you want to do it and, and implement it the yeah. best way what you can do. But there's no licensing fee as such. No, no licensing fee, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, uh, related to that one is that. Um, I mean, can the um, company be kind of TOGAF certified? Um, actually, no. There's no such thing as a, as a certification for an organization. Uh, uh, 
like you could be certified against ISO 20,000 or ISO 9,000 or something like that. Uh, because you can use TOGAF in so many ways. You can use part of it, you can use the whole thing, uh, you can pick and choose. So there's no certificate for a, uh, an organization. Uh, but there are certificates for uh, users. So you can certify an individual that I know enough about TOGAF. So there's a uh, training uh, uh, process for, for that and then you can get the certificate that yes you have understood the, the most part uh, how, how TOGAF works. That's uh, very similar to how ITIL works. There's no such thing as an ITIL compliant organization but there are ITIL certified individuals who have taken a course and have passed a, a test. And then basically these individuals uh, kind of have the responsibility to bring the right way exactly. to do the things into yeah, the organization. That, that's the point. Um, so w what are actually the levels for them, the individual? Um, let me see, I think I have, um, you have two levels. You have the foundation level, uh, it's also called level one, and then we have the practitioner level, which is called level two. It used to be called uh, certified, the second level, but uh, now with the newest version of TOGAF, it's uh, called Enterprise Architecture Practitioner, and the first level was Enterprise Architecture Foundation. Both are usually two-day courses, and both end in a, a certification test. They are quite different, the test. The first test is a typical foundation test. Which of the following is or is not something, and then you pick uh, a, a multiple choice. And you have 40 questions, and you need to get 24 of them. That's 60% uh, right. For the practitioner level, it's uh, very different. It's only eight questions, but they're long. They're, it's a huge uh, uh, scenario. And then they ask, you are now the lead architect. What would you uh, recommend as the next step? And then you have four different answers. If you answer the best one, you get five points. If you answer pretty good, you get three points. If you get a bad answer, you get one point. And if you get really, really, really bad, you get zero points. And then you need to get enough points to do. So it's uh, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, it's also multiple choice, but it's not like you can just pick very quickly. This is the right answer. You have to really think about it, and, and it takes, takes some time. But uh, having said that, uh, many people think actually that the practitioner uh, test is a bit easier because it's applying. You don't have to know anything by heart. You can. It's an open book test. You can have TOGAF open. You can check anything you want to check, uh, and it's really about understanding. So it's uh, people usually like 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 that kind of test more than the foundation test. What is the difference between compliant and consistent and conformant? And you, then you scratch your head and you're not really sure. Oh, well, it says practitioner, so it's, yeah, it's about practicing yeah. the TOGAF. Yeah, well, then you have this also the um, over here the men's of the bridge. Yeah, so actually, those people who have already passed uh, a TOGAF nine uh, certificate and they have passed the second level, so they are TOGAF nine certified. Uh, they don't need to uh, take uh, any of those. They can take something called a bridge exam. It's a one day course and a, a short uh, exam and. The content of that is only what has changed in the new version. So you don't need to go through everything uh, here. Unfortunately, it's not possible if you have the TOGAF 9 foundation only. Then you can't take the bridge. You have to, to either get the certification and then take the bridge, or then you have to go through both foundation and practitioner. And actually, not surprising, there's uh, the, the question that what then is the major difference between the TOGAF the new version and the previous version. Yeah, let me go back a few steps here. Uh, I talked uh, in depth about TOGAF ADM. This has not really changed that much. There are minor changes, but uh, basically uh, it's the same. However, what has changed is the structure of TOGAF, and there's a lot of new information. So I'm going to show this again. Uh, look at this, applying TOGAF ADM using Agile Sprints really, really new, nothing about that in, in the old version. D digital technology adoption, a, a guide to readiness assessment or roadmap development, that is new. Uh, a leader's guide to establishing and evolving an AA capability. The TOGAF standard in the digital, digital enterprise, that's new. So basically you could say that uh, TOGAF has evolved into the new uh, thinking of agile and digital that uh, uh, was not present in, in, in the, the older version. Uh, there's one other one, microservices architecture, that also did not exist uh, in the uh, TOGAF 9 uh, part. And actually, we have a new government uh, reference model. So, And many of these also are updated. 
from, from the old version. So uh, the ADM as such, not much changed, uh, but almost everything else has been updated and has been enhanced uh, with, with digital and, and agile thinking. So that's the main uh, uh, difference here. In the, on the foundation course, you won't see that much difference, a little bit, but uh, uh, not too much. In the practitioner course, it's uh, uh, quite a lot of a difference uh, compared to, to, to the, to the uh, old version. So would you recommend of updating to the new version if Absolutely. you have the previous one? Absolutely. Let me show the first uh, here. Uh, most of those uh, frameworks have a uh, version number. Uh, actually, Prince 2 is not a version number, I think. It's just a Prince 2. <laughs> it's just a Prince 2. Oh, it was the yeah. version number at some yeah. point. The, the uh, method formerly known as Prince. Uh, anyway, uh, we, had, uh, we are not talking about Togaf, uh, uh, the 10th edition. Uh, we're talking about COVID uh, 2019 and IT 4. There's absolutely no reason to study uh, any of the old versions. So if you are new to this, always pick the newest version. It's like use, using the uh, the newest map. You can get by by using an old map, but occasionally you will find that it's it's not valid anymore. So always go with the new one. Uh, and then the second question, uh, or maybe the, even the actual question, if you are already certified, uh, do you actually need to, to recertify? It depends on the situation. Uh, if uh, Togaf for you is only something nice to have that looks good in your CV. Maybe you feel that uh, it's not worth uh, spending too much time on, on getting it uh, uh, updated. But on the other hand, if what you do is very close to what is new in Togaf, uh, if you do something with Agile, if you do something with Digital or, or, or something like that, uh, it probably is worth uh, taking the, the bridge exam. Uh, so depends on, 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 on how do you actually uh, uh, see Togaf in your own own uh, situation. Uh, I would always recommend to, to have the newest version of any of those frameworks. How many uh, individuals still actually are worldwide with the Togaf certification, roughly? I forgot to check the exact number, but uh, about 130,000 all over the world. That's all versions. Uh, actually, only about 100 of those are for Togaf, uh, the latest version. So if you take the latest version, we will be a, a very elite group with, 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 uh, <laughs> with, with, with very, very little competition in that area. At least for a while. At least for a while. Before most yeah. of the people up there update yeah. to the, the versions. Um, uh, there's uh, one question you briefly mentioned about the Togaf pro provide different kind of methods to do the things. Um, is there some uh, specific tools that should be used in Togaf, or do the, is it kind of integrated to some of the tools? Uh, actually, Togaf is very agnostic uh, about tools. It doesn't specify or mandate anything. You can do use Togaf with any tool. Uh, so um, uh, basically, you have a paper, paper and pen. You can you can basically do architecture with Togaf. So it doesn't uh, 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 need to have a tool. But there are, of course, um, quite a lot of uh, different tools that are more or less uh, uh, TOGAF compliant. Uh, I don't see it uh, as a necessar necessity to have a, a tool that is completely TOGAF compliant because you will um, change it anyway. You will adapt it to your organization. So uh, you don't need to have a specific tool for that. There are some tools that sort of have the open group approval, but um, it's not, I don't, I don't see it as a, as a necessity. And, uh, uh, and a continuation question about this is about Archimate, because Archimate is also uh, something uh, that the Togaf Open Group owns, but the, there's no link between them in the sense that you don't need to use Archimate if you want to use Togaf. Uh, you can use any notation language you wish. Uh, but of course, uh, if you study Archimate, you will realize that it fits very well into the Togaf framework. So, so uh, it might be useful, but it's not necessary. Okay, very good. Um, then there's a um, question about um, agile, or there was briefly mentioned this agility somewhere here, yeah. our, our agile sprints. Right. Um, how do you see how agile Togaf is? 
Um, Actually, yeah, it's a <laughs> good question because you, uh, if you look at the ADM, uh, it's very easy to see that this is actually the history of this is a waterfall method, uh, and it still shows in the sense that that uh, it uh, sort of implies that when you have the vision, you have the big pictures, and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper uh, until everything is done. However, uh, uh, when you if you're talking about uh, for instance, uh, software development, according to, to TOGAF, you can very well, uh, in phase G, uh, that's where, where the agility uh, applies, you can very well use TOGAF as the model for doing architecture and then use whatever Scrum or, or whatever uh, agile method you want to use uh, in, in the software de development. It works very well. And there's actually the document describing how to do uh, Scrum according to TOGAF. Another question uh, on another uh, sort of facet of the question is, is TOGAF itself agile? Uh, and again, basically no, but in practice, yes, because you can do these uh, uh, planning uh, uh, iterations uh, however agile you want. You can do it very quickly, two week sprints if you want. There's no nothing uh, preventing you from that. But uh, having said that, of course you can see uh, in, in the language and, and the way they, they describe it that the history of TOGAF really is in the 90s. So you can see some of those. But it does take uh, a lot of steps into the agile world. So uh, I would say that uh, it's very, very possible to use TOGAF in an organization that is already agile. So, and um, mm, then there's um, well, kind of a comment that it looks a little bit complex, uh, which it might look. Um, is there kind of like a smaller version or easier version or um, less yeah, something steps like that. <laughs> version? <laughs> Togaf like Tog Light. Uh, Tog of light uh, yeah, uh, not really in the sense that uh, the open group does not. Uh, provide you with a, a, a scaled down version, but uh, it does uh, uh, allow you and, and actually uh, uh, encourage you to scale down. So you can take TOGAF as it is and then decide we are going to skip some of the deliverables, we are going to skip that phase because it's not relevant for us. For instance, in, in Finnish government, they, they use a, a scaled down version of TOGAF that is maybe one-fourth of the, the full uh, version. It's been translated into Finnish. It's called Yeho Satasete Music for those of you who speak Finnish. Uh, it's basically a, a, a TOGAF clone with uh, everything that is uh, waste taken out. So you can do that. You can make a very small version of this. Uh, but uh, you have to do it yourself. There's no model that you can take that this is the the most important things that you need to take, you have to sort of decide on yourself what is what you want to include. Uh, probably because it's it's uh, very different for different kind of uh, organizations, so it's probably not useful to to create a TOGAF light version. You could do it, uh, but um, nobody has done it uh, uh, at least uh, publicly. So I, I'm not aware of any any sort of smaller version of TOGAF that would be publicly available and and useful as such. Except this Finnish version, yeah, it, which actually no, is yeah. available if you speak in Finnish, but yeah. it's only in Finnish. Sorry for the for There's anyone who doesn't speak in Finnish. Barrier. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, How do you see about the talk of uh, evolving in the future, and do you think it's it it's continues to be relevant in the future? Yeah, let me show this again. Most of these frameworks uh, are evolving when they realize that the word changes then they add things, remove things. So it's true for ITIL, it's true for COBIT, and it's definitely true for TOGAF. TOGAF is modular, so it's kind of easy to just add one more thing uh, to it, maybe take something out. So perhaps uh, we don't need to have a new version in the future. Maybe it's just a small update, and then uh, let's say if blockchains becomes a big thing in architecture, then maybe there's just a, a 30 pages on how to use blockchains in, in this kind of architecture and it's it's added maybe to the TOGAF library or maybe to, to the standard itself. But because of the modularity, uh, it seems to be rather easy to, to add later. So I definitely think that there's working on work done in, in the, the background and usually maybe five to seven years something happens and, and there's a new, new version. Yeah, and basically that's how it has been. So basically exactly. there was before this one was the yeah. Dog of Nine, and right. then there was a, 
a little bit modified version 9.2. Yeah. So yeah. probably at some point we might have something a bit modified from this. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, actually, I mean, we basically have spent all the time what we have. So I think at this point it would be good to mention that this uh, webinar is recorded and you can find it uh, in the future on the websites, uh, both uh, on the Theatory and Informator. So you can share it with your colleagues if you want to. And um, we're going to have other webinars coming up. So see them on the websites also and please register to those. Um, and then, as I said, I mean, there are these um, training courses and tests available. So if you think that TOGAF could be interesting for you, then please check these ones and, and consider that if a career in the architecture would be your choice. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been really, really a good session. So have a very good day, everybody. And uh, I hope to see you on the, at least on the web pages.